Yeah, my name is Bill Stein. Um, and I'm basically a developer of Tuflo software, which has sort of become somewhat by stealth. The predominant 2D flood modeling package here in Australia and uh, in the UK is used in about 15 countries around the world now. Um, the plan today is really just to give you a bit of an insight into 1D uh, 2D modeling and what it might be all about. And why I've shown this photo on the front here, I'm not really sure, but it's Monday morning and it's sort of taking the way it starts. Be careful of the sharks in this position. So one thing to be draining is, you know, the issue we have is that when you have a situation like on the screen here where you've got, you know, flow down a creek, approaching a highway, this is Bruce Highway, just north of here, okay. infamous little site called Yellow Creek, flows through a bridge structure here, you've got big banks of coal that's here, you've got some substantial levee banks, so you see the water's basically going all over the place. And so when you get into that situation, you've got a fairly complex situation. And really the purpose of today is to give you an insight into how you uh, might sort of model these situations in both this, this sort of cross drainage or major highways situations or in urban areas. I'm just going to go on in case that is a few other slides we can go So going back about 10 years, the main roads department in Queensland, what, throwing up the question, should we be using 2D modelling for uh, modelling? Basically, they're highway structures. And at the same time as this, there's a, uh, a legal case that went all the way to the High Court of Australia that was um, upheld in favour of the person, the landowner, and the whole case has to be reheard. And so, partly in preparation for that, the main roads department were addressing the question as to whether they should be doing some high level modelling to, to deal with these situations. And on this side of New Lake Creek, where the picture was before, they went. As far as we, we built a physical model, so you can see here, there's a pile onto the bridge structure, some press blocks holding it down there. You see down the bottom here, this is a physical model in flood. So you've got water just going across the road there, these things are the gauges. These sticks in the water are actually each tree. There's actually a tree survey, we went out and surveyed the size and dimension of each of the major trees. You see some rocks in the water there, that's the rough and rough and rough. So, an uh, actual one sort of 30 scale physical model was built. I guess the perception was that that would be the ultimate answer. Up until, that, up until the point of this late 90s, uh, 1D modeling had essentially been used to model the situation. And so, what you have here, which I'll have on, shows on the screen, but basically in a 1D model, you have to predefine the flow path. So, if we're saying from this point here to this point here, we're going to give it a, in this case, it's probably a rear over this levee bank. And we'll define that, give it a cross section, give it some information. And you basically, as a modeler, you have to try to predefine all the flow paths. You run the model. This is showing the flood level. So 11.52 there, 11.47, 10.69. So you can sort of see how the water drops down through your system. I might have some coldness through here. But basically, that's how we did it with 1D. Very quite laborious, quite, quite painful in hindsight. In 2D, you start to get a much better feel of how the water's flowing. You have a much more intensive computational grid. So you're computing the flood level and flow at each of those arrows. You see how the water's squirting through and spreading through the very dense vegetation, which forces the water north along the north causeway. So you get a much better feel as to what's going on with how the water's moving. And it's, and it's much more accurate in terms of being closer to the physics of how the water flows. So this, this study was very fortunate that it had some very, very good calibration data to prove these models. And that was quite interesting. In fact, one of the floods actually occurred during the study and was witnessed by all. So this is our bridge structure, which is showing you before, just about to hit the other side of the bridge deck. So there's excellent data sets, including some gauge measurements where some guys hung some velocity measurements over the edge of the bridge there. And that, this is from the... Um, 99 flood, so these are recorded levels, so the recorded levels here at the peak of the flood. So we ran the model and you, and this is what we get as a comparison. So this is actually what would be regarded as a good comparison in terms of the flood. We had an interesting situation up in here where um, the landowner upstream had actually excavated his barn so that flooding on his site, there's his house here, flooding on his site wouldn't be as bad as it could be. And uh, so we had to somehow model that as well. 
Anyway, the point of this exercise is we had a physical model, 2D models, 1D models, and very, very good calibration data. So it's very interesting to look at the outcomes of that very substantial study. Um, and the findings really focus on the ability of models to reproduce the afflux from the bridge and from all the developers that are using that model. Basically, the gist of it was without calibration data, 1D models just were not close. You, if you just took your standard 1D model, put your standard parameters in, you didn't come close to reproducing that bridge outflux. 2D models perform generally pretty well, um, but um, it certainly helped having calibration data because it allowed you to fine tune. Um, your model. And probably a very interesting one from a physical model point of view, if, if we really struggle with the physical model. Um, the, um, basically, because when we first ran it, it was very smooth, it gave way too low flood levels, and we had to keep putting those trees in, putting the rocks in, and it was a very, very interesting exercise. We, you, know, you can't just make one of these scale models and it comes out perfectly. So, a lot of effort made here. Once we had it calibrated, it, it performed, performed very well in terms of predictions of the path license. So the other key finding was, and I'll let you just read this one, it's actually quite true. <coughs> so never had total faith in something you can walk around. And never had, and I think, and once you've done computer modeling, you never have a problem. Mm -hmm. Um, now, the beauty about 2D models allows you to much more accurately um, depict the impacts of, of you know, what if scenario. So here we have a single, this is a single carriage scenario, bridge structure, two large banks of coal here. And then what happened in the late, early 90s, late 80s, was that that pyro was duplicating. These large banks of coal was, were removed and a small pipe was placed in instead. But to compensate for that, the bridge structure was actually increased by three spans. So we've got a wider bridge structure than we have here. The consequence is that we have very, very different flow paths. So here we've got a lot of water heading up to the northern culverts, whereas here we don't. And this is a water level contour, so a 0.2 metre increment. So you can see here that water level contours and the general lie of the water, the 3D surface of the water is quite different. And then the impacts on the flooding, this is showing the increase in flooding due to that um, removing those culverses tend to increase the <coughs> water level here, and the net effect is an increase in flood level up in here. And you can see this, this is actually showing an animation of the, of the 92 flood, which is actually the largest flood they've had there in recent time. So you can see the flood coming down, this is the lagoon here, this is the highway. So 92 of those culverts have been removed. The flood rises and just goes over the top of the road as was through here, as was observed by a number of people, and then it goes. But the beauty of 2D modeling, in terms of predicting the impacts of the flooding, you can get something like this. So essentially what you're seeing here is the yellow is no change in flood level. So at this point here, the Removal of those cults is having a bit of an increase in flood level with the orange red shades. The green shades are a decrease in flood level. And as the flood levels rise, you see the effect of those cults becomes increased. Um, but the levee bank here is sort of buffeting. It's, that impact is not going further because of that levee bank. But as the flood gets higher, the impact of those change in the high education, or because of the education, starts to spread further afield and you start to get quite substantial increases up in So with 2D modeling, you can get a much better feel as to the consequences of how this works and so forth. Now, I'm going to be a little bit technical just for a few minutes and try to give you some idea of what, why this is. Uh, in a 1D system, if we have a restriction, so that what is coming, approaching a bridge structure or culverts, what is moving might be fairly slowly, speeds up through the structure and then slows down again. Now what that does is cause us to form maybe some eddies on the downstream side, give it a bit of constriction inside the structure. And whenever that happens, whenever the water is forced to expand or change its direction and, and change its general movement, water loses energy. 
And to model that in a 1D sense, we just basically lump all that energy as a coefficient. We just say, oh, all the energy lost to, due to the water coming in and then re expanding inside the structure here is worth this much. And on the outlet, we this water, you know, the early that is formed here and the water having to expand this much energy is lost. Okay. And it's largely a bit of a bit of a guess. Well, guessing is very wrong, but it's in unusual situations, this is definitely a very much engineering judgment score. <coughs> when you move to 2D modeling, it's a different story. Because you're solving much more complicated equations and you're modeling how the water spreads and moves around. So it's modeling how the water contracts and then re-expands. And essentially, you don't need, to some extent, to specify contraction expansion loss, but you do get a much better um, representation of how that water expands than it's made. So I should point out it's not perfect. It's still not a um, perfect analysis. It's like if your grid size is not fine enough, you won't be picking up that sort of circulation. And if your bridge piece in there, you still need to have an analysis for those extra things that are too fine for your model to pick up. Just to demonstrate how 1D and 2D works, I have a little model here, so this goes around the right angle bend, so here that's a 1D model. Now, from a 1D point of view, it doesn't even really even know that that bend is there. It's just going along here and it goes along there, and all the flows in essentially one direction. And that's the water set of profile you'd have along that channel. And at point A is about halfway. Now, if you make a little 2D model of that, and we plot the profile along there, and you see quite a different story. You get a, a surcharge at the a super elevation of the bend here, where the water sort of surges up against the, uh, the ball. And that's this here. So basically, the water, this is a higher water level here, and you've got a lower water level down here. So the water surcharges against the ball, and that goes. But importantly, what happens is the upstream water level, the water level of the upstream water level, is, is higher because there's not only have you lost energy due to your bed friction, which some of you, the man exam equation, but you've also lost energy because of that water going around that bend. And that's why this red line finishes at a higher point at the upstream bend. So 2D will automatically model those energy losses. But it's not perfect. This is actually the Brisbane River. It's downstream from the city, so we're sort of off the left-hand side of the slide. Um, story Bridge for those who know Brisbane. So this is a, a 2D representation of flow around this bend. We're doing this modeling for the floor. This is a 3D. Now those of you uh, maybe look at it closely, you may have picked up that this is the velocities of waters on the surface. So you see how that, these velocities here are sort of heading more northwards than these ones here. These are just going around the bend. These ones are going more north. So in this situation, you're actually getting Circulation is in the vertical, and that itself loses more energy. So when you go to a, a very, very, this is a very, quite an extreme example, you've got a, a 180 degree bend, um, and yeah, so it's quite, a, quite an unusual situation, but it does occur. And when you look at the head drop across this bend here, in 2D you get 23 centimeters, and in 3D you get 30 centimeters. So once again, because that water is circulating in the vertical as well as losing energy. So 2D isn't perfect, but I guess it's a lot better than 1D. And 3D, of course, is probably into the future. Now, just talk now a bit about modeling urban areas. This is where a lot of 3D modeling has moved into the urban areas in the last recent years. Um, this is one of our very early urban area models, it's actually in Bristol in the UK. Um, so this is your LIDAR or ALS, you can get constructed from that. There's a river that flows down through here. You can see there's not well represented by the LIDAR, but then the whole river goes underground. In their wisdom in the 1800s, they, they didn't like this river, so they covered it over and put a, uh, a great big sort of semi-arched structure to take the water away. There's an aerial photo. This is the centre of Bristol, so this area here is the focus of the study. And ever since they covered that river over, they've had no end of flooding problems. It's, you know, if you look through all the records, they've had flooding problems for centuries. Uh, that's just the land use, which is another layer that feeds into your 2D model. So 
So here we have some monthly open channels. Because the LiDAR is no, not representing the underneath the water and so forth, and it's quite confined. There's a picture here. This is what the river looks like. A lot of vegetation in the water that make the DTM not very good through there. So a lot of that is cross sections, cross sectional surveys. There's even little openings through this rock and stone wall that we have to unlock. Um, you see these pink lines. Now that's the underground river system. So originally they built it all the way out through the here, which then just shows out to the harbour. Uh, that wasn't enough, so they had floating ponds, so they've got one, two, three extra outlets try and take more water away from this area here. And even that wasn't enough. In fact, upstream of this picture here, they divert 40% of the 100 year flow through a five kilometer tunnel to another part of the uh, coastline because they're still having simple flooding problems. <laughs> so you've got to be careful when you come to your rivers so. over. And this is what it looks like underneath. This is what they replace the river with. It's probably worse in most for the smaller floods, but for big floods, it's, it's not, not enough. <coughs> Um, so we've got a question here. So this is a nice little Monday to model because you've got everything from your open channels, your trunk drainage, and then you've got your pipe system. And you have uh, manholes as well to, feed, to interconnect with the underlying 2D. So this is uh, when you run, this is a case of actually an extreme situation where that big pipe on the tunnel, that the diversion goes to that have failed. And so here you have the water. It's coming down the river here. So all, everything's in the 1D system at the moment. And as the flood water starts to rise in here, that actually water goes back through a pipe system and starts to flood the M5. There is a flat gate on that, but we thought we'd take the flat gate off. It looks a bit more exciting. So you see the water starting to break its banks now and, and work overland. You see water surcharging up through the manholes in this area here. So the, basically the pressure head inside your main front line there is greater than the pan surface, so you have more search up and out. And the black goes. And so the water just tends to propagate down the pan. Now all this overland area is only a small part of the total flow, but it's where all the damage is caused, and that's very, very hard to model in my opinion, virtually impossible. And that's why they um, did this one year two model. So that's a good little example of a one year two D model. Um, on, now move to, this is further down locally, this is Salter Creek, Newcastle. Um, very exciting area to model. This is a 1990 flood, and of course some of you would remember the 2007 event, which is essentially a 100 year event. 1990 is about an 80 year event. Super critical flow, so you wouldn't want to jump in here. There's a hydraulic jump there. This is just near the shopping centre where we used to live, and so no problem. You can see, I've just zoomed into this here, unfortunately the quality of the photo it's not great, but you can see here, that's the water surcharging against the middle here. So it's nearly the height of a truck in terms of how much that water is jetting up. Give you some idea of how fast that water is moving. So that's what you often have in the Wundi channels, just really wild sort of flows. Whereas in the overland areas, you can have fairly fast flows, but you tend to have a lot of this stuff as well, which is just sort of spreading out and, and so forth. So you've got quite a range of flows, and this is where the Wundi 2D really does become very beneficial. So I'm just zooming into a small part of the model here. So this is a concrete line drain structures and another drain coming in here. Newcastle's been one of those civil engineers, drainage engineers delights where they just turn all the trees into concrete line drains. And so this is your flood depths. And these are your velocities. So down here we have 1D representation with velocities up to in some areas seven or eight meters per second for some of these structures. And that's really, really fast. And that's been recorded in this way. In the 2D area, which is off to the sides here, you see the water coming down through here and down the streets and through the houses and stuff. So it's sort of it's a nice image of how the two can work together. What's important in here is if, if you were doing this as one D, your water level here would be essentially the same as your water level out here. That's just one of the assumptions in one D, whereas 2D models how the water surface varies over the plane. And you can see here, each of these contours is a half metre increment. So from this point here, down to the drain here, it's over a metre drop in water level. And in this situation, it's because we've got a very a bridge structure here, which is very, well, this picture here. So basically, the water got up to about this high. And you can just see by looking at it, that bridge structure is just going to totally choke, 
check everything. It's just a very poorly designed drainage structure. <coughs> and so what you're having here is all that water is not getting through the bridge structure, so it's <coughs> spilling out around here, spilling out around here, and causing a lot of flooding in this area. <coughs> um, these are recorded flood levels. So you've got 13.8 down to 12.6. So these are actually flood marks of people's houses. The red marks are, are very accurate marks, the orange are less accurate than the yellow are the rough ones. So you can see this is the difference with the, uh, what the model gave. So for example here we're within 6 centimetres, 2 centimetres, 14 centimetres. So you can see here, if, if you didn't have that 2D model, you wouldn't be able to reproduce that big variation of water. And this is just a profile going down the creek here. And all those flood marks here are these ones here. Now the level in the creek is much lower, as, um, as you can see here, much lower. So if you just do the 1D profile and try and calibrate, you'd actually, if you try to calibrate your model, say so blue line came up to here, well, that would be wrong. And once again, so this is another demonstration of why 1D, 2D works very well. Now I'm just going to move downstream, I'm just going to down, like another pan downstream a little bit. Um, the other beauty about 2D modeling is how you can um, communicate to the layperson or to your client. And here we have uh, velocities. You can see the water, once again, another bridge structure. The water is drifting around this bridge structure. And you know, we, we sort of calibrated our model and done nearly finished the study. And um, the council engineer came up with this photo, as they often do at the end. And this photo is looking, standing on this bridge here. So we're standing here, looking upstream. And you'll see that he's showing a lot of water coming in over the floodplain into the river. And you see how fast that water's moving away, and it's just totally wild. And, and he said, his point to us was, well, you're showing the water is flowing around here, yet this photo is um, coming in off the side. Something's not quite right there. So, of course, we have to dive into it all. And, um, what we did, we zoomed and had a look at how this is zoomed into that bridge structure. It's a bit of a coarse animation, but it gives you some idea. That's a pipe coming in the side there. And here's the flood is coming down, rising. Now, this is near the peak of the flood. So, you all that water is pouring around that bridge structure. His comment was that the water should be coming in through here. And as the flood waters recede, and that's about the time of that photo, you see the water is pouring back into the drain structure. So he was very happy. We were very happy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, so once again, 2D, in 1D you just can't do that because you have to predefine your flow paths. You just can't do that in 1D. It's 2D, you, you have the capacity to show things that never have been before. And nothing like a happy time. Um, okay, on to some of the other tricky things that have been involving fences. What do we do with fences? Here we have fences that have been wiped out in the 2007 flood in Newcastle. This, this is a two, from the 2007 flood that has just been totally flat. And actually, that's the same structure as that earlier flood with the water spouting out. So, what we have here is a, um, well, some of the new features that we're sort of building in is the ability to uh, model collapsing fences. So here we have two fences. So the water's coming down through here. These pink fences have been specified that they can collapse once the depth water level or the depth level is higher than a certain amount. So the water's ponding up behind this fence here. And eventually that starts to go, it starts to collapse, and that flows through here. This property here was flood free in a, with the fence solid, but once Water that gets a fire, this fence breaks here and it becomes flooded. So it's now sort of possible to get into these situations where you can animate or and simulate quite you know, interesting scenarios in the urban environment. And I always throw this one in because <laughs> what do you do about blockages? Well, we haven't quite answered that one totally, even other than. Uh, you can sort of box and block this, and I, I tell people this is interesting one because this this is a rail that is specified because it doesn't collect everything. <laughs> <laughs> I think they might have to really find that definition. And how we model that, I don't know. So. <laughs> but in Newcastle, uh, many some of you may know there are two areas where they had really bad flooding. One was the CBD, and that was due to a container 
the blockage, we might have that as a tree. Yeah. And it wasn't until we stuck that into the blockage in our model in that area that we come close to reproducing that flood in that part of the model. Yeah. So blockage is a and just looking into the future bit, we have a new scheme which is very exciting. This is actually modeling a flume test of uh, surge of water. So there's a pond of water here that's let go and surcharging against the building. And this is only a few meters wide. We're down to elements in our model of only two and a half centimeters in this case here. And uh, what you'll see here is here is uh, basically a, a jump forming on top of that. So the water comes surging down and you see a hydraulic jump reflecting back up and looking upstream. So we're starting to get into some pretty exciting stuff. And I should just say as each of these new developments, each of these new exciting things comes along, what's totally, totally dependent on here is faster computers. So this stuff has only been really possible. Today. So in conclusion, basically 2D or 1D, 2D modeling is um, essentially here in Australia and it's becoming that way in the UK. The United States is still thinking about it. Um, it's pretty well mandatory for most flood studies. There are situations where 1D is fine, but these days 2D is really the norm. Um, and you can use them for a wide range of applications, big river systems, right down to, as you see, the urban environment. Um, there are, some, you know, in my view, so there are some significant gains. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's certainly a big improvement on our funding modeling days. And it's very, one of its big strengths is its ability to <coughs> uh, flood effect from a body scenario, from a new road, a new drainage structure. And the other big benefit to me, my mind is the ability for the, particularly when you're presenting to the community or to someone who isn't familiar with this sort of um, modelling, is the ability to understand and um, accept what you have done is, is much, much better. So basically it's produced sort of pretty animations, but still it uh, gives us a big step forward in that.